Gang, we're addressing some important questions today, like, is two years enough experience to go out and start your own accounting firm? Wow, uh, does the school that I go to matter? Will employers look at that? Some newbie questions, and then some stuff for seasonal old crotchety vets, like, what do I do when I'm just overwhelmed? How do, well, like, best practices for getting out from under having too much stuff to do? When's the right time to hire a CFO and fire ourselves? Interesting, and what are my thoughts on ClickUp? Incoming hot take alert. Come on in, it's Jason Daly. Can I just say it warms the cockles of my cold accountant soul whenever I get questions from folks who are thinking about starting their own firm. Bless your hearts, do it. There's like too many, the profession needs more new firms from people that have like a clear vision for how to run a firm differently. I think like the public perception of what accounting firms are is a very old model that one by one we are changing. And that is a good thing because ultimately what we do enables entrepreneurs, which is an awesome thing. It's two years enough experience. So my plan is to finish my CPA. I'm a first year tax associate, but I wanna do like fractional CFO, CAS sort of thing, start their own firm. Plan is to finish the CPA and leave after a full year or two and then launch the firm. I'd pivot to a private industry job while I build the firm to save time and build operational skills. Does this seem reasonable? Am I not spending enough time in public? I really thrive on biz dev and wanna get out of the grunt work ASAP, but I wanna do it right. If you read this, thank you. Listen, gang, I read everything, except for the stuff I don't see. So, is two years enough to go out and start your own firm? It's a good question. I would say it's not so much the like absolute years as it is the amount of experience you're getting and the thing that you ultimately want to do. So one thing you called out in this question was you enjoy business development and that is one of the really hard things to get into when you're first starting out. It's one of those itches that's really hard to scratch until you go out and start your own firm. Some larger firms, well, even smaller firms will allow for this, like staff people doing biz dev. But ultimately you are building something that is not an asset for you, it is an asset for somebody else. So business development, arguably the hardest thing to really get great experience with. And I'm thinking in the small firm realm or I don't know, valuable experience with until you go out on your own. Certainly a thing that can be done for other people, but again, you're building that asset for other people rather than building it for yourself. Not the end of the world, but from a technical standpoint, how many years should you be working before doing your own thing? I would say there is a sliding scale of, you know, if you wanna do anything and everything in the world, and honestly, a lot of firms are set up that way to support just a vast different type of client, and they'll do businesses and 1040s, and hey, what's a an odd 5,500 here? Uh, 990, like they'll take all these different things. That requires a tremendous amount of experience. If you have a, like, I would say the more focused view you have of exactly what you want to do, the less experience you probably need, if you can get experience that is relevant to that. So if you work just on benefit plan audits of like a very specific type or just business returns for this one type of person, the path for you is probably shorter than it is for somebody else if you can get meaningful experience in that domain before launching your own thing. So if you're not getting experience ultimately doing what you want to do, probably wasting time. Now, oftentimes it takes a bit of experience and like various different things to actually know what you're gonna enjoy and what you don't enjoy. So I always encourage people, try to find a situation where you're able to get a taste of audit tax, like CAS, CFO. If you can get a taste for a little bit of all that stuff, you're gonna learn what you actually enjoy and could do for a decade. I don't know, two years feels pretty quick to me. Me after two years, whew, boy, I was not doing anything remotely useful two years into it. But that was just my experience and it's not gonna be the same for everyone. Honestly, I think, and this is kind of a bummer, age to a degree plays a role here. It was really hard for me to, as you know, a 23 year old, go out and find other successful business owners who were 23 years old. And man, let me tell you, if you are a youngin, this whole thing gets a whole lot easier when the people who are making money are your age. You are just like, you don't realize what an uphill climb you are fighting when all the people that are your clients are old enough to be your dad. That was something I was definitely up against at that age. The reality is you can do this at any age. There are people that come straight out of school and go straight into running their firm. They make it happen. I think it's kind of a you specific thing. 
For me, after two years, it was probably a confidence thing and you may not have that problem. If you're looking to do CFO or cast work, if you have a really clear view for the type of person that you wanna support, that is you know, the type of business, the problems that they have that you can solve for, I would say if you've got that nailed down, there isn't really any harm in starting that side hustle and seeing how it goes. Moving to private while you do the side hustle, like maybe not a bad move, but I wouldn't fully make the jump until I had actually found something I love and a specific type of problem that I could solve, gotten a taste of that kind of within the side hustle and do it. So I don't know that I would like, honestly, I think anybody can begin side hustling at any time. And so maybe that's the best advice to take here. And it might take you six months to be like, oh man, this is a killer business. It might take you six years because you're like, eh, I started doing some tax and I learned I actually don't like that. That's good. That's like great experience and it's worth doing. So the better question in my mind than when do I go all in on my own, I would say is probably when is the right time to start hustling, buddy, any old time, especially if it is to get experience that you're not getting in your day job. Uh, more live from a YouTube comment. I'm faced with a dilemma. I'd love to get your feedback. I'm a senior accountant and I've spent the majority of my career in banking and PE. I would like to go get my CPA and open a firm. So this would mean I need to obtain a master's degree, probably for the credit hour requirement, I imagine. But I'm curious if the school matters. I have one group of people saying go to this specific school because it's cheap and online. Other people tell me to go to a large state school due to better credibility. From your perspective as a firm or business owner, does school matter? It matters, but maybe not for like the immediately clear reason. I got my master's at Portland State and that was a really positive experience because Portland State had a killer network. And through that lens, it really mattered. I don't know enough about how they educate people compared to how other schools educate people to say whether the like style and quality of that education was the big driver, but I will say the network that that enabled was really good. So that is something to worth taking in mind. Otherwise, to answer the question, does the school matter? Besides that, in my opinion, opinion, not really. And as much as I am pro-credential and I am for credentials, I would also say your credential doesn't matter. Talked about this online a bit last week. I think if a client is asking about your credentials, you have already lost the battle. The grounds on which I want to get a client in is that they already know that I'm an expert specifically in what they do. And if they are looking at your credential to make a decision, man, you know how many other CPAs there are and EAs and you need to give them a more compelling way to differentiate you relative to everyone else than a credential. Now, I still got one and like I don't regret it and credentials are valuable. Obviously, unless if you're wanting to do a test work, something like that, then yeah, you definitely have to have that. But when it comes to the school you pick, I would almost think more about like the network that that school could enable. Or when you start to get a vision for what type of firm you want to run, what sort of people do you want to support? Like, do you enjoy working with startups or software companies? Like, is there a crossover between the type of folks you may enjoy working with and sort of the network that that school has, like what they're known for? Ultimately, there's enough demand in this profession that you can be successful in pretty much any version of this that you decide you want to do. The biggest stopper is going to be your own energy and how sustainable this is for you. So rather than optimizing for maybe what your clients will think, I would recommend you optimize for what you learn that you enjoy. And you may not know exactly what that is yet until you get a taste of it. But if you don't enjoy what you're doing, that firm's just going to suck no matter what. Like nobody's at their best when they're not feeling energized and and when they don't enjoy the people that they work with and all that. So I would say, I know this is a scary thing to do before you've started that firm, but it is okay to be selfish and think about like, hey, what's the coolest version of this for me that I would enjoy the most? Start there. You're gonna come at it with like this really fun, exciting kind of level of energy that will greatly increase the likelihood of your firm being successful and of you being able to do that for, you know, a decade. What do you think? Is that bad advice? Uh, anybody else, you disagree, feel free to burn that down in the comments. There's a lot of people listening to the show that have a way more experience than I do. A lot of really smart people that listen to the show. This episode is sponsored in part by the fine folks at Cloud Accountant Staffing. Do you hire accountants? Bless your little heart. Not the best part of the job, in my opinion. Not something I ever enjoyed. Well, listen. You can build your accounting dream team with talented offshore accountants in the Philippines that work 100% full-time for your firm. Their accountants aren't freelancing or contracting for multiple firms, they're all yours. They work exclusively for you and are incentivized to stay with you and your team long-term. They're not gonna get swiped. Cloud Accountant Staffing is 100% dedicated to the accounting industry. 
and founded by a former accounting firm owner that understands your business, knows your pain points. They had to hire some accountants and they said, you know what, we're gonna build our own pipeline in the Philippines. Gonna pull in some super talented people and then open that up to other firms. Basically, that's the story. Uh, we've been talking about, a lot about staffing, building more resilient staffing pipelines for your firms. I had staff in the Philippines, totally red-pilled me to like, oh geez, like we need to globalize the way that we get our work done. Uh, check these folks out. Link in the show description, cloudaccountantstaffing.com. Hey, this episode is sponsored in part by Canopy, the practice management system. Canopy unlocks the firm that you always wanted. Think about it. Close your eyes, lean back in that chair. What is the firm that you always wanted? Oh wait, Canopy unlocks it. And they do this by unclunking accounting firms with an end-to-end -end solution that makes your tech stack feel a little less stacky because it's end-to-end. -end. Putting our customers first with world-class user experience, support, education, and innovation rooted in customer feedback, working and working well anywhere and for any size or type of firm, wherever you are now and wherever you're going. Multiplying your efforts so your practice requires less proverbial midnight oil. You know, I, sidebar, if you go to the conferences, Canopy's got like, they always do some like really good little like sort of, you know, the stuff that they use to like trick you into coming to the booth. Well, this year they've had like Legos out there. Maybe, maybe you double down on the midnight oil thing, you know? Maybe like, uh, I don't know, give away a little, little uh, you know, little actual midnight oil. I guess it would need to burn too, but that one's free. I think it's a good idea. Delighting your clients with a modern, easy to use portal that helps you get the info you need when you need it. That is Canopy. Check out the link in the show notes to learn more. This is one we've all felt a lot. How do you best navigate a firm when you are in the trenches? Getting sucked back into the monster is really demoralizing. We talked about this, I think it was yesterday. A couple things to keep in mind. You will always underestimate how much work everything will be because mentally we develop our expected bandwidth around just the things that we remember that you have to do in our head. And you always assume the best case scenario when we forget all of the fiddly little things that will inevitably come up between now and then. And you could pare this down to as little as just, oh, I didn't get as much done today as I wanted to. And you may feel that like every single day, that's normal. It's because you sit down at the start of the day and you're like, oh, here's all the things I can reasonably get done in a day. And then things inevitably come up that maybe weren't on your radar. So you don't get those things done. That's completely normal, but it is a great rationale for why you need a more explicit capacity planning process. And we did an episode on this way back. I think it had capacity planning in the name. You could search for it. What a late, no, put it in the show notes, Jason. Gosh. But you need to build into that capacity planning more excess than you think. Because running a firm where you're one person away from being a big time, like deep doo-doo, that's a stressful way to go about life. And that one person could be you. Like if you're a solo practitioner, like what happens when you get sick? Like when you can't work, you never want to like leave yourself in the position where one person going can really put you in trouble. And I totally get how hard that is and how that sounds wild. Like, what do you mean? Like, no, if this person, like they're so key, they're so one of one. If we don't have them, we're in big trouble. But I'm telling you, like you got to build your business with contingency plans because stuff happens. And if you're going to be the one to step in every single time, you will just perpetually be the victim of your own business. And a lot of this comes back to capacity and redundancies and all of that that can feel wasteful, but like you are hedging against a very real risk. And I don't know about you, like the very worst part of running a firm with a bunch of people was being the bottom of the funnel of 40 people and all the things that could go wrong professionally, personally for these people, like you're carrying the weight of a lot and you will always underestimate like just what will come up and what will slip through the cracks. So you have to build a lot of bandwidth in there, but also you need perspective, like external perspective. When you turn up in a firm every single day, like you don't realize just how group thinky you are and how limited your tunnel vision is. I think everyone needs an external feedback loop and there's a lot of forms that that could take. That could take a coach. I think more and more we're seeing kind of community-based versions of this. This could be a mastermind group where you meet with other people who run firms on a recurring basis. I think it's important to have some sort of external source of truth 
or advice because you don't quite realize just how blinded you are to your daily routine. And oftentimes what that looks like is you stepping into things and you agreeing to things that you have no business to agree to. And then you're like, why did I just do this? I'm like straight back to being swamped again. So two best bits of advice, man, give yourself some grace. You need more space than you're giving yourself. Second, pull in an external advisor of some kind, like they're gonna shine a light on the stuff you're doing that maybe you shouldn't do. Because if you don't have that, nobody else in your life has permission to look at you and go, stop doing that, right? Like, I don't know, my wife could, but like she doesn't, she doesn't have enough transparency into all the things that I do to really know, like that was a really bad choice, man. So like, you, you need that. That is a helpful thing to have in your life. When's the right time to hire a CEO and fire ourselves? That's going to sound wild to a lot of you. Why would I have started a firm if I was just going to hand over the reins to somebody? This is a very real thing if you want to run like a growth firm. There's definitely zero to one people and then there's like one to 10 people and then 10 to a million types of people. This is a very new, like nuanced sort of situational thing. But many accountants honestly like find that they really enjoy being an operator and like they just want to do the work. And sometimes that can be at odds with running your accounting firm. Now, I do think acknowledging the limitations that will come with kind of that approach, I do still think that like you can be completely happy running your own firm and just enjoying doing the work. You just have to acknowledge that you're going to have some limitations, like being the operator and the person that has to carry all of that stuff. You are missing like more of the sort of entrepreneurial perspective on your business and maybe how kind of some bigger picture decisions may ultimately have positive impacts on how the work gets done. Those are kind of the big blind spots that the operator types have. But if you're an operator and you're growing your firm and you're like, man, I'm at my limit. That's oftentimes a situation where maybe you could partner with somebody and you know merge with another firm where they're kind of gonna be the other side of that. In fact, in my practice, this is kind of what we had was my partner was really an operator and he enjoyed being hands-on with clients. And I was the opposite. I wanted to be kind of the manager, the entrepreneur, the big picture strategy guy and the systems guy. And that worked pretty well because we knew that about ourselves and we could fill those roles within the business. So when is the right time to hire a CEO and fire ourselves? If you're to the point where you're no longer enjoying running a firm, just kind of being the operator, then I don't know that you go as far as like firing yourself, but maybe there's a different setup there that works better for you pulling in that person that can kind of like be the other side of the coin for you. Sidebar, this kind of like ties into like selling your practice. People don't talk enough about how selling a practice is not like a, you know, final decision. Or they talk about building a practice as if like their retirement plan is to sell the practice and that's their retirement. Bad idea, don't do that. But you know what's way more interesting to me than that is building a practice and then selling it and then giving it a year or two and being like, I'm pretty sure I know how to do this better this time. Like, why do you only ever have to run a single practice until the end of time? I don't know why we think that way. Okay, Derek Foote, this was a cool idea. What do you think of using the automated task list feature in a practice management system to create a wrap-up list for the client? So a tax example, they get a tailored message with tasks to sign the 8879, pay X to the IRS, pay Y to the state, pay quarterly estimates, etc. It gives them tailored instructions and a checklist, but would this also cause clutter or confusion? So we've talked a lot about requests and what a big advocate kid I am for you building explicit request lists for clients, especially ones that can set up to recur automatically so that you're not emailing people asking for things. We need to get away from that. Derek's taking this one step further to say like, let's say you're going to go deliver a tax return. Do you actually set up within that same system the to-dos that they need to knock out, like signing an 8879, uh, making a specific payment? And I like that because oftentimes the problem there is the acknowledgement of exactly what you need them to do versus what you can do for them. And so sometimes they're like, you know, you see the big awful transmittal letter on the top of it on the front of a tax return. And they're like, yeah, do they really think I'm going to do all this, let alone like read it, let alone do all of these things. And you're like, well, here are the things that I actually need you to do. And that can be ambiguous sometimes, right? So would you go as far as building that into like the request list or the tasks that are within your practice management system? I can say I like that as long as there is an understanding that them knocking it off and acknowledging it is a confirmation that they've done it. I think if there's a version that isn't helpful, it's the version where the client is just dismissing them to go away, right? Uh, then it's probably not useful for them if they're just getting rid of it. Kind of creates confusion for me because I don't know if that means that they actually did it or didn't do it. 
Honestly, like I would, I would probably like this if it was like they were uploading a confirmation of it. I don't know. So these days, like Oregon Department of Revenue, I can go online and see all my clients' payments. So I don't necessarily need the client to confirm that for me. But I do love the idea of them having a more explicit to-do list. As long as there isn't any ambiguity around whether they're just like making those go away, as long as it actually means they're doing them if they mark them complete. I actually really like that because your practice management system will automatically follow up with them and remind them to do those things. I think that's smart. Oftentimes what we're doing is we're just like emailing a list of like, okay, this is done, here are your to-dos. And then it's kind of like, we don't really think about it anymore. But to have like an actual confirmation that they did those things would be helpful because oftentimes you circle them back the next year or later and asking, did you actually do this thing that I asked you to do? This week's episode, it is sponsored in part by Copilot, the uber flexible client portal. Copilot lets you provide clients a one-stop shop experience, not a strip mall. This ain't no strip mall. You go straight in, everything you need, one-stop shop with a client portal that streamlines messaging, payments, file sharing, help centers, custom app access, and more. Copilot Automations is a set of pre-built workflows available on Zapier and our API. It helps you save time, reduce human error, and run more streamlined business. You can set up automations that streamline sign up, like new client sign up, onboarding, intake forms, and more. Check out some of the automations you can set up with our API or with Zapier. Assign forms to newly activated Copilot clients. Okay, update clients from new Copilot form submissions. I, change of address, maybe, you know, the holy grail. Upload files to Google Drive when new files are uploaded to Copilot like that. Check out copilot.com to learn more and start a 14 day free trial. What have you got to lose? This episode is sponsored in part by Client Hub. This week on Tales from the Hub, we are back. Last time we discussed how a super smart accounting firm went to scaling new heights and there they learned about Client Hub's new vision, your firm on GPT. Tell me more. That vision means three big areas of investment for Client Hub. One, generate it. Use AI to generate job tasks and task details. Generate intelligent email replies. <gasps> Automatically ask clients for missing information. What? Two, answer it. Don't just search by keyword, just ask a question and intelligently look across emails, meeting transcripts, internal notes. Yeah, 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 even within files to bring you the answer. Oh, mama, three, up-level it. AI summarizes meeting notes and action items. It tells you what's in a file without opening it. Gives you a sentiment of each client based on their inner. Are you for real? Sound amazing? Be part of making it happen by becoming a firm that runs on Client Hub. Client Hub's working with users ooh, to co-develop, test, iterate, and fully optimize these capabilities. Oh, that's it for this week's episode of Tales from the Hub. Learn more about Client Hub at clienthub.app or the link in the show notes. Okay, last one, ClickUp. Oh boy. You know what? Everybody keeps jumping on me about like ClickUp and Notion and stuff like that because recently I was like doing a rundown of kind of here are the apps that need to be at the core of your firm. And all the apps that I included were accounting, like accounting industry specific apps. So I, I'll come back to the question here. Mo asked, did you ever explore ClickUp or your niche practice? Would love to hear your thoughts on this software as it's super cheap and yet so powerful and all these other platforms are harder to customize to your niche firm. And then Herman followed up in the YouTube comments there uh, that he uses it. It's been difficult to set up for some things, but it's super flexible. I would tell you that ClickUp is like everything you ever want. Like it is the most ridiculous feature set you've ever seen, which is the best and the worst part of ClickUp. And I think what most of us will experience is you will work within a system that feels restrictive. That is an opinionated system of here's the right way to do it. And you'll get frustrated bumping up against the guardrails of that restrictive system. And so then you'll look to the other side of the fence at something like ClickUp and you'll be like, oh baby, complete flexibility, total freedom. That is what we need. I can tell you on the other side of that fence is a lot of questioning yourself, is a lot of procrastination in the form of like, oh, maybe we could shut it up this way and instead of that way, and a system that is actually harder to lock down for a team. And this won't be a problem for everybody, but one big thing that I ran up against was, 
yes, you can do like anything in ClickUp. But what I actually need is the ability to set up anything, but then for that to be like a rock solid pipeline that people can't break, that they can't mess with. And at the time we didn't have enough controls with ClickUp and this was up to the end of last year. Like we weren't able to lock that system down enough to make it super turnkey. So like an example of a really turnkey general system is Process Street, where it's like a super locked down every status you have to acknowledge that you've done all of these things. And it's a more sort of like kind of locked down pipeline sort of approach. And on the spectrum of total freedom to opinionated systems, like there are definitely pros and cons of each. And I, ultimately, like I, I put my cast practice on ClickUp. So like I, I looked at all of that stuff and I said, this is gonna be the best for me. And in my career for years, like probably the first decade in my career, I was a big advocate of going out and buying the general tools because they are way cheaper and honestly better. Like there's like, I don't, maybe better is too subjective. They are more technically complex, like the things that are going into them and the engineering investment. Like it's just much more because these are bigger companies. They're serving general customers. And for the first decade, I was like, why would I not just buy these? And to be honest now, I've come back the other way. I was starting to come back this other way a bit as I had gone all in on ClickUp and I'm like, I now see the value of something that is more opinionated. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. But what has me coming back that way even more, actually really big time now, is AI. AI fundamentally changes what we want out of our tool. Because if you think about the holy grail of AI applications for general purpose software, it's Microsoft Copilot, like it just is. Because it's everything and it is like AI fabric throughout the whole thing and then a chat assistant that sits on top of it. What does Microsoft 365 not do, right? They've got some programs that are really good. They got a whole bunch of programs that are like a half-baked version of some other program. But that ought to be the holy grail of general use software because it's email, it's projects, it's files, it's meetings, it's team chat, it is literally everything and AI can see into all of that stuff and make your life easier. So when a client emails you a question and it generates a suggested reply, that reply can take in your meeting transcript from a week ago, can take into account the team chat you had with your team members about the client yesterday, can take into account the email from the client that you haven't read yet, the documents of the client, like suggest those attachments, it can see into all that stuff. And so that's really, really powerful. So part of what has me going away from like the Trellos and the notions of the clickups of the world, specifically for running my practice, I should add, I still run my life on Notion, but for my practice, I'm, a, I'm really like, I think email, honestly, may be the single thing that AI makes, improves upon the most for accountants. Uh, email, messaging, however you communicate with your clients, AI is going to be such a huge help here because we spend a massive percentage of our time on client communications. You know, Nio put the question out, if you could build your dream AI bot to do anything for you, what would it do? Most common answer was email. And AI, like we already know AI can write really, really well. But when AI is sitting on top of all of your context, all of the data about that client, past email exchanges you've had with them, those suggested replies are gonna be so darn good. You're never gonna have to go out and grab that file yourself again. It can suggest the attachment. It's gonna have a huge impact. But if I'm running my entire business in ClickUp, and I get an email from a client in Outlook. That system will not benefit from all that external context. This is not something that integrations can easily solve. Maybe click up pivots and they're like, oh, we're gonna build this killer like email client. Seems kind of weird. They've got like a half-baked version of email built in with more kind of like a, I don't know, more of a commenting vibe. But with AI, it becomes more important than ever for the system that you use for communications to be able to see into everything else, right? Imagine having like the richness of all that information available to the email system when it is helping you compose those emails. That is huge. And if I were to start a firm tomorrow, I would be really concerned putting all of my organizational history into that system that my email client cannot see into. So that's big reason number one, why I'm shying away from like your ClickUps, your Trellos, your, st your stuff like that right now. And honestly, that's not like a super sci-fi concept. Like we already see Carbon is doing generative email replies based on the past email thread. I don't think they're going as far as like looking into documents and projects and stuff like that yet. But this is literally in like the promo videos that Microsoft has done for Microsoft 365. The generative email replies that can see into those other things, like that is a reality, like we will have that this year. So that's got me cooling on those standalone kind of project management systems, like kind of on steroids. The second big thing for 
for me is agents, AI agents. If you haven't seen the past episodes on these, check them out. They're a huge deal. AI agents will be the best thing that has ever happened to the accounting specific space. I think agents will actually grow the category of software for accountants like in a huge way. If we think about the very, very specific problems that our businesses have, they are specific to the tools that our clients use to how accounting works, to how tax works and all of that. And so the day that Microsoft Copilot comes out, that will be the coolest, the best all-in-one AI enabled system that there is. But ultimately its ceiling is lower than the ceiling of industry specific tools. And the biggest place we'll see this is around agents. Agents are the AI bots that will actually go out and do work for us. That will hop into a QuickBooks file and grab that thing that you need to then attach it to an email. This isn't sci-fi, we're already here. We did an episode about how Pixie has built this for zero. I've been sharing on social media. I've been testing a browser agent where you chat with it like ChatGPT and tell it to go out and do functions in your browser for you. So I say, go out and run a cash basis 2022 balance sheet and income statement from this QuickBooks file. I submit that message. It opens a new Chrome window and that agent is now working in the background, navigating my QuickBooks file, going to reports, going to profit and loss, changing the date range, saving it to a PDF is all doing this in a window in the background of my computer. That stuff's already here. And so the future of your project management system is assigning tasks, not just to human users, but to agent users that can go out and do things that have these capabilities. So how agents extend the tools that we use is kind of like a next big evolution in what software in our space will look like. And Microsoft's not going to touch that. ClickUp's not going to touch that. Notion isn't going to touch that. So right now, if I were still running my firm and I still have my ClickUp, like, is this a reason to pull the plug on ClickUp? Like, probably not. I wouldn't be doing that right now. But in, if I had to make a decision tomorrow on where I'm building my organizational history, where I'm building all that context, I'm going to put it on a tool inside the accounting space because ultimately the AI enabled ceiling for our space specific tools is higher than that of, you know, Microsoft 365, Copilot, and click up or notion when those things are not interested in managing the client communication side of how I work. So those are kind of the two big reasons why I've cooled on non-industry tools. I have not always been that way. This is the most pro industry tool I've ever been today, honestly. And AI has like actually reinforced that big time. Big time. What movie is that from? I hope it's not embarrassing. That's it for Q&A Wednesday. Thanks for coming and hanging. You got questions, keep them coming, especially if you're a noob. Don't be afraid to ask those newbie questions. Everybody here agrees who runs firms. We need more really talented people running rad accounting firms. So thanks for coming and hanging. I'll see you tomorrow.